Welcome to the first video of the 14th chapter of the Crystal Clear Electronics 2 curriculum. Our exciting topic will be the calibration of sensors. The chapter was written by Gergely Palotás and proofread by Tamás Horváth. But before we start, I would like to introduce our presenter, Szabolcs Pájer, who teaches mathematics and physics at the Elte Bújai János Practice Secondary School in Szombathely and organizes the Crystal Clear Electronics Study Group. Thank you, welcome everyone. I'm very happy that my partner today is Marcel Tirog, who was a former student of mine for four years at the previously mentioned school. Marcel graduated recently in mathematics and physics at an advanced level with excellent results. Since September, he has been studying as a university student in Budapest. This chapter is divided into two parts. In the first video, we'll learn about the sensors and how to manage the measurement results. In the second part, we will set up a measurement setup and calibrate the sensor. Now, I suggest we go over to the table to get to know the device in detail, connect it, program it, implement the task for today, and carry out the calibration. Let's get started! In the previous chapter, we learned about different types of sensors. Generally speaking, these sensors convert some state or change in the environment into an electrical signal that is transmitted to a signal processing unit. In the development board, the signal processing unit is the microcontroller. Unfortunately, due to inaccuracies in the sensor or the measurement method or other factors affecting the measurement, the measured value does not match the real value this is called the measurement error. The measurement is considered to be completely accurate when the error calculation has been carried out. There are basically two types of errors in the measurement result. The systematic errors are errors in the measurement method and in the execution of the measurement. An example is the linearity error of an instrument, where the value provided by the instrument is not directly proportional to the true value. The second type of error is the random error the cause of which is either unknown, or would be disproportionately costly to detect, making it unreasonable to search for. A good example of this is the quantization error, where an analog signal is converted to a digital signal, and the signal levels are assumed to be equal over a range. The exact magnitude and sign of a random error is unknown. In contrast, the magnitude and sign of systematic error can be determined and can be reduced by calibration bringing the result of our measurement even closer to the real value of the quantity being measured. In everyday life, we often encounter situations where we need to calibrate a device. Now let's find out what exactly calibration means. By definition, calibration is the operation of establishing the relationship between the value measured by the sensor and the real value of the quantity to be measured under given conditions. This correct value is provided by a device known as a standard, specifically used to check the other measuring instrument's accuracy. If precise laboratory instruments are not available, it is not possible to perform a perfect calibration, but some types of errors can be eliminated, or at least reduced, by simpler methods. Let us look at the process of calibrating the offset error using the example of a digital scale. These scales are mostly operated by means of some kind of strain gauge. The stamp is actually an electrical resistor whose resistance value changes in proportion to its elongation. When you turn on the scale, you have not yet put anything on it, the correct value of the quantity to be measured is zero, and this is assigned to the resistance value measured at that time. Of course, this only eliminates the offset error, not other types of error such as linearity error. In other words, if you then add one kilogram of mass it is not certain that the scale will read that much. Okay, but why do we have to do this calibration every time we switch on the scales? This is where the term, in the given circumstances you also mentioned in the definition, plays an important role. For example, at a different temperature, a different resistance value is measured for 0 kg because the resistance of the strain gauge stamp changes with temperature. If you use the scale a lot, over time the strain gauge stamp will wear out and you will measure a different value than when it was new. 
We will illustrate the detailed calibration process with another practical example. To do this, we will build a circuit that can be used to measure temperature. There are several different types and uses of temperature sensors. We will use one of the most common types, the thermistor, for our circuit. A thermistor is a temperature-dependent resistor. Of course, any material will change its resistance to some extent as the temperature changes, but for these devices, the material of the sensor is chosen so that the change in resistance is significant. That's right. Two main types of thermistors are distinguished according to the nature of the resistance variation. If the resistance of a thermistor decreases with increasing temperature, it is called a negative characteristic thermistor, usually abbreviated as NTC, negative temperature coefficient. If, on the other hand, the resistance of the thermistor increases as the temperature increases, it is called a positive characteristic thermistor, abbreviated PTC, positive temperature coefficient. For our circuit, we will use an NTC thermistor. It's important to note that the NTC thermistor does not exceed the maximum power rating allowed which can be seen in the catalog. Above this limit, the thermistor would not be able to dissipate the heat generated properly and would continue to heat up, causing its resistance to drop even further and this self-excitation process would continue until the device fails. This self-excitation process is called positive feedback. These are the characteristics of the NTC thermistor we have chosen. It's clearly seen that the resistance of the thermistor decreases as the temperature increases, and it can also be seen from the graph that the characteristic is not linear, so the rate of change of temperature and resistance is not directly proportional. This suggests that it is not sufficient to solve a simple linear equation to calculate the temperature. So our task is to find the equation that describes the characteristics of the sensor. From the characteristics, it appears to be an exponential function. So will our equation be logarithmic? Well, on the datasheet of some NTC sensors, there is a table covering the whole operating temperature range, where the temperature value is associated with the corresponding resistance value, but only in 5 degrees centigrade increments. For this reason, we would definitely need further calculations of the resistance values for the temperatures within the 5 degrees ranges. Of course, we could then use the approximation that the characteristics within these ranges are linear, but let us now aim for a more precise solution. Marty's hunch was correct, and using the values provided by the manufacturer, we can calculate the coefficients of the steinhardt hart logarithmic equation that models the variation of the resistance of the semiconductors. The capital T in the equation represents the temperature, in kelvins of course. Capital R is the resistance, and capital A, B, and C are the steinhardt hard coefficients we are looking for. To calculate the three coefficients, we need three different pairs of temperature resistance values. It's advisable to choose two of these near the edges of the operating temperature range and one in the middle of the range to get the most accurate result. So overall, we should solve a system of three unknown nonlinear equations. Since this is a fairly common problem, we can find programs specifically designed for this purpose, where we only must give the three pairs of values mentioned above as input and get the coefficients as a result. The three pairs of values we have chosen are as follows. T1 is minus 40 degrees Celsius, R1 is 332,094 ohms, T2 is 25 degrees Celsius and R2 is 10,000 ohms, T3 is 85 degrees Celsius and R3 is 1,070 ohms. The Steinhardt Hart coefficients calculated from these are The A is about 1.14 times 10 on the minus third b is about 2.33 times 10 on the minus 4th, and c is about 0 0.94 times 10 on the minus 7th. As a check, calculate the temperature for 10 kilo ohms using the equation given, and compare it with the value given in the datasheet. The final result, converted to degrees Celsius, is t equals 298.15 minus 273.15, or 25 degrees Celsius. So we got exactly what we expected. 
This brings us to the end of the first video, but stay tuned, because in the next one, we will build our measuring device together and we'll also see how our example code works and test the thermometer. Bye. Bye.